The Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada now brings you Philippine NARS, news and features about the Filipino-American nursing community and beyond. And now, here's your host, Doris Bauer. Well, good evening to you all, Philippine NARS listeners and followers. How are you all doing? Safe and healthy, we hope, during this COVID pandemic. Well, as you know, Philippine NARS is brought to you by PNAND, or the Philippine Nurses Association, in collaboration with PHLB Radio. Thank you for joining us today. And we do have a very interesting topic to talk about today, about women and Alzheimer's disease. So don't, um, don't leave. Stay, stay put. Okay. But before we get to that, um, the PNAND would like to update you on our masks and face shields project that we are doing. We've had a very busy week. We delivered 50 masks to uh, Kindred Hospital, the Sahara Campus, and 50 meals were provided for by ACDC or the um, Asian Community Development Council. We also delivered 200 adult face shields, 20 pediatric shields, and 15 pediatric masks to UMC. This was also in collaboration with the Nevada Nurses Association. Then we also delivered 100 masks and 100 face shields to Silver Ridge Healthcare, which is a nursing home. More deliveries are scheduled this week. And uh, of course, this project was made possible by your donations. Thank you to our new donors for their generosity. We have to shout out to we have a shout out to Jenny Bard. Hi, Jenny, and Dr. Chris Miranda from the Nevada Heart and Vascular Practice. Thank you so much for your donations. Um, so, if you want to donate for this worthy cause, please um, visit our website pnand.org. Remember, masks on, shields up, protecting Nevada together. Okay. So more than 5.5 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease, of whom two thirds are women. Women also account for 60% of caregivers of those afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. There are differences in Alzheimer's disease with regards to sex and risk factors. So women have a higher lifetime risk in developing Alzheimer's disease. So here to talk to us today about women and Alzheimer's disease is Dr. Jessica Caldwell from the Cleveland Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Caldwell. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Okay, um, Dr. Caldwell is, I'm not sure. Johan, are we okay? Okay. All right. Okay, so Dr. Jessica Caldwell is a PhD, ABPP, and CN. She is the director of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Prevention Center at the Cleveland Clinic. And she's also the director of clinical training in neuropsychology. Uh, she uh, obtained her highest honors in psychology at Princeton University and her PhD in clinical psychology with a minor in neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She completed her pre-doctoral internship at Harvard University and Massachusetts General, and she currently holds a primary academic appointment as an assistant professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. Well, she's got a lot to talk about. So, Dr. Caldwell, do you have anything to add to that? That was a great introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I have a lot to say about our center and about what we're doing and what we hope to do down the line. So I'm just excited to get started tonight. Okay, great, great. So, Dr. Caldwell, before we talk to you about this health issue, um, I'd like our listeners to know that Maria Shriver has been working closely with the Cleveland Clinic about the Women's Alzheimer's Prevention uh, Clinic, right? And um, Maria Shriver is the founder of Women's Alzheimer's Movement. 
So let's take a minute to listen to what she has to say. I am so excited. I had this dream a couple of years ago that we could open a prevention clinic um, for women, uh, that they could come and find out about their brains, they could track their brains, they could learn more about Alzheimer's. And I called up Larry Ruvo and I said, let's work on this together. I think it would be great. And here we are, I think it's about two years later and I couldn't be more excited. I think this clinic will change everything. I think it'll change um, people's experiences on the ground. I think it will change people's experiences virtually. And I think it will give so many people hope that there's a center out there that they can go to, learn from, learn about their brain health, uh, learn about how their brain changes. And I think it will bring people more in touch with their brain than ever before. I started the Women's Alzheimer's Movement about 10 years ago because 10 years ago, I reported for the very first time to the nation that Alzheimer's discriminates against women. What does that mean? It means that every 65 seconds, a new brain develops Alzheimer's and that two thirds of those brains belong to women. And lo and behold, everywhere I went, no one knew why that was. So the Women's Alzheimer's Movement was born to try to answer that question, to try to fund research into women's brains. And hopefully by doing so, we'll close the research gap, we'll close the knowledge gap, and we'll be a part of understanding why Alzheimer's discriminates against women, and maybe we'll even be a part of wiping out Alzheimer's once and for all. I got involved in the Alzheimer's issue in 2003 when my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I've written books uh, for children, I've produced documentaries, I've executive produced films, I've led movements, and I always had this idea that what could I do that would help everyday people? And that's this, that's this clinic. Um, it's there for everyday people to come and get help. So while WAM can also fund research, which really makes a difference, and I think if we've learned anything through COVID, it's that research matters. It matters to invest in science. It matters to try to understand the brain. Uh, that's important, but it's also super important to be helpful to people on the ground who are struggling. So I couldn't be happier that that we're having this partnership. I imagine all kinds of things can happen with it, but it's a great first step. I think the brain is the next great frontier, and I feel a little bit like Neil Armstrong, kind of, this is one giant step for womanhood. This is one giant step for the brain. This is one giant step for everybody who believes in prevention, for anybody who believes that we can wipe out Alzheimer's in our lifetime. So there's a lot of hope uh, that's going into this clinic. The Women's Alzheimer's Movement is really proud to be partnering with the Ruvo Center, the Cleveland Clinic. I first met um, the people at the Ruvo Center, Larry, years, decades ago, uh, when that was just an idea, when there was no building, there was nothing but a vision. So I think it's important to have a vision. I think it's important to stay focused on your vision because visions do become reality. They really do. Well, wonderful. She's such a wonderful person because visions do really become reality. That's wonderful. Okay, well, thank you, Maria Schreiber. All right, Dr. Caldwell, um, what inspired you to come to work at the Cleveland Clinic? Two things I think really inspired me to work here. And one was that I've always had a passion for memory disorders and in particular, Alzheimer's disease. And that's one of the major specialties of this center here in Las Vegas. And in addition, I love research. And because of the philanthropy environment that we have in Las Vegas, I was able to start out my career here doing both research and clinical work, which is a really difficult thing to find as a neuropsychologist. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Well, we welcome you to our community. And yes, this is a very generous community, right? Okay, so uh, 
for the benefit of most of the listeners, what exactly is Alzheimer's disease? What causes Alzheimer's? So Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative brain disorder or a disorder that causes the brain to lose cells and volume over time with aging um, and with the disease process. And Alzheimer's disease is the changes in the brain are proteins that build up that shouldn't build up. And in particular, amyloid and tau proteins build up and stop the brain from working well. And in particular, stop memory from working well first because of where they uh, build up first in the brain. In terms of what causes Alzheimer's disease, we don't have a great answer to that question yet. Um, we know pieces of the answer, but not the whole answer. So Alzheimer's disease, it can be caused early in life by genetics. And if you get it later in life, we know a little less. So we know genetics increases your risk. Your family history could increase your risk. But there's also a lot of other factors that increase risk that are things we have control over, like our diet and our physical activity level. I was kind of wondering where diet's going to come into that. <laughs> but um, yes, thank you for that. Um, do you happen to have, Dr. Baldwin, the latest statistics for Alzheimer's? How does Alzheimer's affect women and men differently? So the numbers are that in the U.S. right now, there are 5.8 million people with Alzheimer's and about 3.8 million of those are women. And like you had mentioned before, it's so critical to know that women are also two thirds of caregivers for Alzheimer's patients. Okay. Um, and that oftentimes, more often than with men, women actually quit their jobs to become full-time caregivers. So right. we're being impacted on the disease side as well as on the caregiving side and, and our, our livelihoods. Right, right. That's, that's true. That's very, very true. So um, what are some of the facts that women do not know maybe about Alzheimer's and why they have such a high risk factor for that? Sure. So there are a lot of different ways that Alzheimer's disease impacts men and women differently. And I think women are surprised by some of these. Um, one in particular is menopause. So oh. most women I meet don't know that menopause may be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And mm. the reason for that is because estrogen has a major role in supporting our memory systems. So for most of our lives, women have on average better memory than men for verbal things like a store <laughs> list or a story. It's really true. Um, mm -hmm. And estrogen might be part of that story. But then we hit menopause and we lose a lot of estrogen. Many women, even though we think of es menopause as really about reproduction, maybe hot flashes, many women also do complain of memory problems around the time of menopause. And really it could be related to estrogen losing its ability to support your hippocampus, which is the region of the brain wow. that's important for taking new information and shuttling it into long-term memory. So without estrogen, we have less support and we also have less support for the health of that region. Oh, so that's what's wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, it's, it is a very common response and no, it, it's just not known that really menopause can make a big impact. Okay, so what are the other risks besides like maybe menopause? Are there any other risk factors involved? Yes. So uh, there are some risk factors that for, for Alzheimer's disease that are similar in women and men. So the number one is aging. So the older we get, the greater risk for Alzheimer's disease. And that's not different, uh, except that women tend to live older than men, longer than men. There are but there are other factors that beyond that for a long time, researchers thought that it, that would explain the whole difference between women and men in Alzheimer's disease. But now we know there are things that are specific to women like menopause. There are also things that women tend to have more often than men. And two of those are depression and low physical activity levels, both of which can increase Alzheimer's risks. Then there are risk factors that seem to impact women's brains more than men's if they both have a problem. For example, having a copy of the ApoE4 gene or the most common risk gene for late onset Alzheimer's seems to increase women's risk of actually getting the disease more than it does a man's. Wow. Yes, it is. It's, <laughs> it's really surprising. 
is there that is that is something else mm -hmm. okay so um you're you're talking uh prevention so what does prevention mean and how do we do that Sure. Prevention really means looking at a disease and thinking about how can we stop it from occurring before it starts. Uh. So prevention, when we're talking about prevention, we're looking at working with women who don't have a memory problem yet and hoping, hoping that we can use the most updated science that says up to 40% of current Alzheimer's disease cases might be preventable by modifying things and helping women to really, really do that. Again, there's no really guarantee of preventing Alzheimer's disease. We're still really learning a lot about how we might be able to do that. But what we do is we try to get there by modifying those risks. That's the pathway to prevention. Very, very good, very good. So this is why uh, the uh, Women's Alzheimer's Movement Prevention Center was uh, opened or established, right? That, is that right, Dr. Caldwell? Absolutely, yes. Okay, great, great. That's exciting to know here in our community, actually. So what do you do at the clinic? Can well, you tell us what the clinic's all about? Sure, what we do at our center is really we try to give women a really comprehensive assessment of all of the risks that we know that can increase risk for Alzheimer's disease or just poor aging in general. And then we take all of that information and we give women really comprehensive, detailed directions on where to start with risk reduction and where they might make the most impact in their own lives. So we do, we, we do that assessment in a really uh, specific way and it's, it, we start women online. Mm -hmm. So a woman would come to our website and fill out a lot of questionnaires online that will ask about everything from your medical history to your mood, your family history, how you're sleeping. So really getting that level of detail. And then even more, we have a woman come to our center and get even more detail assessment and in, in particular, at our center, we get some physical measurements, things like height and weight. And we also have women do some cognitive testing, just a really brief screening to make sure a woman is a good candidate for our clinic. And then we have a feedback and recommendations visit. This visit is two hours long and it's really detailed for women. It's one hour with myself and one hour with a family medicine physician. And in those two hours, we focus on first the psychosocial piece. So your mood, your, your thinking, how you're active in terms of social life. And then we also focus on the medical side of things. So what's your diet? What's your exercise? And how can we push that forward to a more brain healthy risk reduction lifestyle? After a woman leaves, we, we don't just uh, say goodbye. We do check in quarterly by email and, and get a sense of how the recommendations are actually being implemented in day-to-day -day life, if they're useful. And we ask women some questions about their mood and other things that we think should change if risk reduction is um, being applied. Then in a year, we see women back and we do that whole thing again. And we can really get a sense for each woman individually, what's working, what's changing, how's, how does their health and brain health in particular look after a year of prevention? Oh, good. So the commitment for this research is uh, a couple of years or and more I'm, than that? I'm glad you said that. So we are a three-year pilot clinic and we are a clinic first and foremost. So um, we are not just a research study. This is a I clinical see, okay. visit. Um, and we're a three-year pilot because we are funded in large part by philanthropy. So we are a partnership between Maria Shriver's The Women's Alzheimer's Movement and our Keep Memory Alive organization at Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. And yeah. so we, we have a commitment for funding for three years, which covers almost everything that we do, although some things are billed to insurance. And then it's our goal to really make it sustainable over time. Um, 
but in terms of research, it's absolutely a part of our plan. Um, this is a topic where you really can't run a clinic like this and expect to not mm -hmm. do research. And mm -hmm. for me, mm -hmm. it, it, the reason is because I think it's our responsibility to provide the best clinical service possible that, that women find useful. And then after that, because we want to know if this is working. And so we hope to sure. extend a research study over time as well. That's great. That's wonderful. So uh, who are the best candidates to be seen at this clinic? So the best candidates for our clinic are women who don't have any current memory diagnosis. So when I say memory diagnosis, I mean things like dementia or mild cognitive impairment. Those folks wouldn't be a candidate for prevention because we want to get people before there's a, a concern or a problem. Women of any age are welcome. We think that our target audience is really midlife pretty broadly from about 35 to 60. But in, in our current interest, in terms of the website, we have people as young as 18 and people as old as 88 so far signed up. So there's no oh. limit on age. I think the most important thing though, for people interested in this clinic, the best candidates are people who are committed to making a change. So mm -hmm. our clinic, while we do give very, very detailed recommendations, they aren't a checkbox and, and done kind of recommendations. We're asking women to change their lives. And we know that this is a big ask, especially at midlife. So yep. we're working at midlife, maybe raising small kids, maybe caregiving for a parent with Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot going on and we will support women through this, but it's really going to take a commitment. That's great. That's great. I'm glad that clinic is there, actually. So um, what I think you mentioned some maybe preventative strategies that you provide to women. Are there any more that any more strategies that you can mention? Sure. Besides modifying the diet and exercise? Yes. And so I, I'm going to step on exercise and diet one more time, because um, those two things are things that I think are maybe the di most difficult to change on your own. So we do actually offer two 12 week classes that are virtual. They're an hour a week and one is on nutrition and one is on physical activity. And those are really designed for women who need that extra support in making a lifestyle change. Anyone from someone who is eating a very non-healthy diet to someone who just wants to improve things Similarly with physical activity, everything from someone who doesn't exercise at all to someone who wants to optimize their exercise for brain health. Um, so okay. I think we, we really emphasize exercise and diet throughout the clinic. But there are other things that we recommend frequently as well. And one of those is working on sleep. So sleep is often a problem at midlife, especially around the time of menopause. And unfortunately, when we sleep, that's when we consolidate our memory. We're really taking that new oh. information and storing it. So if we're not sleeping, we're not getting that benefit. And in addition, sleep is a time where our brain clears out the trash. And one of the types of trash that's cleared is amyloid. Amyloid is that protein that builds up too much in Alzheimer's. So if you're not sleeping, you could potentially be building up risk that way as well. Wow. And does that hold same through for with men then? Get yes. Good night's sleep? Yes. And sleep is important across the board. I, I think just with menopause, it's possible that sleep is hitting women a little bit harder around that time of life. True. True. And uh, how about if you fall asleep while the TV is going? <laughs> That's not right. right. We do talk about screen time. So recommendations from uh, health uh, bodies really say that you shouldn't have any screen time about an hour before bed, at minimum oh. 30 minutes before bed. I don't think many of us follow that. Um, yeah including me. <laughs> yes. And I'm guilty of it as well. The cell phones are kind of ubiquitous, but I, what approach that I take with women is really, you know, we can't, we can't have perfection and we can't do everything all at once. The goal, the perfection is don't have screen time for 30 minutes at least, but if you're sleeping well and you have a lot of other areas where you need work, let's hit those first and come back to that when we can. Okay, so does stress have anything to do with that as well or? 
Yes, I'm so glad you said that. So stress is really a tax on your brain. Stress is, it, it's a distraction. It means that it's harder for you to do things like eat right and exercise when you're stressed. Many people get depressed. So stress interacts with all of these risk factors. Mm. One reason why it's particularly bad is when you are chronically stressed. So not just a project at work or a particular challenge with a child, but day in, day out, you can't get away from it. Sometimes this happens in caregiving. Um, yeah. That kind of chronic stress feeds back on the hippocampus. Again, I keep saying that word, but all of these systems really are converging there when I talk about these risks. And if that's, that cycle is on for too long, you actually start to lose cells there. We know that women actually turn off that cycle worse than men do. We do a better job activating quickly when we're stressed, but we do a worse job turning it off when, things, when stress lasts too long. Great, so that's the correlation between the stress and the caregiver having a higher risk for uh, getting Alzheimer's, right? It could very well be part of that. And, could, you know, yeah. there are other things that everything is interlocking, but caregivers, I think they're stressed. But when you're a caregiver, you also might not take care of yourself with your exercise and your diet. You yeah. might not be getting out socially, whether it's because of stigma or it's because you just don't have a means to do that without your partner. Um, and social isolation is also a risk factor. Great, great. Well, um, I know you said you do some virtual um, interaction with uh, with your patients. So with the COVID pandemic, do you see uh, the women then face-to-face -face a lot more than you do virtual exams or how does that work um, at your clinic? Yes, so actually before COVID, um, we designed this clinic to be a hybrid between virtual and in-person appointments. And we really have adapted it a bit, but we've kept some of those in-person appointments because we really need to. So again, our, our visits start virtually with that web interaction, but then we have women come into the clinic for an assessment and a recommendation visit. For that assessment visit, really, we can't do things um, well, like weight and height virtually. We can't do the cognitive <laughs> testing well virtually mm -hmm. either. It, there's, there's a lot of factors that can really interfere. Um, and then we do have women come back in person for the recommendation visit because a piece of that recommendation visit is actually a medical exam with the family uh, medicine. Uh, doctor. Another thing that, you know, while it could be done virtually, it's, it's a lot harder to do that. Um, but we do follow up again with women virtually after that. So, for example, for women coming from out of town, we design it so it's just one trip to Las Vegas. Um, and we encourage women to book appointments out, you know, in six months or eight months, if that's what they'd like, we, we can right. book out that far. We have a lot of interest. There are local folks who want to come now and we can have wow. folks who don't come on later. Um, and then those classes that I mentioned, they were originally designed to be in person, but we're switching them fully virtual because, you know, I think it's, it's just important to not be in groups and to really respect the safety there. But I think also us going virtual now with those classes will really give us an opportunity to make those classes available to people at different times of the day, at, in different states. And I think that that will be a key to expanding access there. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. Do you guys do Zumba? Because I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't actually have any of the exercise classes, although I would encourage you, but it's a great. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyways, okay, so um, what are some of the things maybe that women can do now for better brain health? Um, what I always recommend, number one, is, is sleep. Coming back to that, you know, prioritize your sleep. Get eight hours if you can. Um, if you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, um, know that you can talk to your doctor about those things. And it's not just medications that can help with sleep. There's actually a therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia that works really well for folks that have a very hard time sleeping or their sleep cycle is shifted, for example, due to shift work. Um, after sleep, I recommend exercise. 
it's it's so critical. It's a multitasker because exercise can improve mood. It can be social. It reduces stress. It's good for your memory. It actually increases a chemical called BDNF in the brain that supports memory formation. And it increases it right away, like in five minutes. They've measured people exercising and look at that chemical. And it also increases it over time. So yeah. exercise and sleep are, are number one and two. But then just stay active. You know, if, yeah. if you're, if you look at your life, are you socially active? Are you mentally active? And um, can you get those things into your life if you're not? Okay, wow. That's a good information right there. So um, you are pretty big on uh, clinical research. Um, why is it that clinical research is important, especially to you and what you do at the clinic? So clinical research is really research on a specific disease topic with the goal of understanding why the disease happens and then how to treat it, slow it, or prevent it. And so in terms of my interest, research is really just key to what we're doing because prevention is a very new clinical approach. The science of prevention is still being studied, still being worked out. We have a lot of knowledge, but we are still lacking a lot of knowledge. It's very hard to do prevention studies because you need big groups of healthy people who want to stick around for decades. So um, research in this area is, is uh, for, for me as a, as a researcher, is really a commitment over time um, and really it's, it's so important for women who might be at risk for Alzheimer's disease if they're concerned about it to not just participate in, in clinical services, but also to consider participating in research to really be part of that process of figuring out the disease. Great, great. So how can women make an appointment to the clinic? What, um, let us know. <laughs> okay. So the way to make an appointment is to start with our website. And that is www.womenpreventalz.org. And there we have an appointments page. And that will walk women through how to get started. It basically involves entering in a bit of information about you into one of our web forms to make sure that you're a good candidate for our clinic and that you meet our criteria. Um, okay. After. After you get to that point, then we do send a message to our clinical team and you're put on the list to be called. I will say here um, that we, when we opened on, on June 18th, we were overwhelmed with interest. We actually brought down the phone system and we brought down the website with so many people trying to contact us. And so we are a bit behind on getting back to people with scheduling but we can see in real time everything coming in online and we're monitoring it. We know the timestamp of when you finish things and we're communicating with people by email, just letting, letting them know, you know, you're on our list. We're working on those scheduling calls. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm so excited, you know, about this clinic really. And you know what the, it does, what it can do for the future. So this is wonderful. Wonderful. Thank so, you. Yeah, we're excited. Um, anyways, um, so what is then your message to those who are afflicted with Alzheimer's and maybe their caregivers? Sure. So for those people who have Alzheimer's disease, I would just recommend, you know, to stay engaged. All of these things that we're talking about right now, staying socially connected, mentally active, physically active, those are all still good for your brain and potentially have impact on the, the quickness with which the disease progresses. So it's not a time to stop acting, it's a time to keep engaging with all of those strategies. And for caregivers, I would just say, take care of yourself. And I know sometimes that it's, it seems easy to say that and it can be really feel really impossible to enact that. Um, and I would just encourage caregivers to, to try to put any time aside for themselves that they can. Sometimes it's five minutes. Sometimes it could be, you know, a day. Um, and if you feel like you're really stuck and you don't have other resources, 
one potential idea is if your partner who has Alzheimer's disease is connected to a health system like uh, Cleveland Clinic, there might be a social work provider who can talk with you and help you to kind of see some new resources in the community or see some ideas that maybe you haven't thought of yet. And just getting that outside perspective can really help. Yeah, and, and there are a lot of resources out there, which I'm sure can be found also at your website, correct? Yeah, so we, we have connection on our website to lots of national resources, and we're building up the lo local list as well. Fantastic. Okay. Well, um, just one last question I know. Um, what is your message to the public uh, in this COVID pandemic that we're in right now? I think my big message is, again, try to maintain your routines and your connections. As it's not ideal, none of it's ideal, but COVID and any particular situation where you can't interact with other people, it limits your physical activity and people get in ruts, people get depressed. It's very stressful for all of us. So it's important to remember to just maintain those good habits. And if you don't have one, maybe try to just do one thing, whether it's just going for a walk, if you're able to do that, just talking with a friend on Zoom or a similar um, kind of medium once a day, once a week, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. put things in place to give yourself a routine and, and try to get, it, get through this um, as best as we can. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jessica Caldwell, for um, joining us today. Um, it was truly enlightening to know everything that you guys are doing. I know my mom had Alzheimer's and so this is truly near and dear to my heart and um, I'm sure to a lot of people as well. So thank you again for all you do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, of course, of course, thank you. And, um, and to our listeners, uh, let's just, to, let's just some review some quick facts for you. Uh, in the United States, um, more than 13 million women are either living with Alzheimer's or caring for somebody who has it. And almost two thirds of Americans living with Alzheimer's are women. And women in their 60s are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's over the rest of their lives as they develop breast cancer. More than 60% of Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers are women, and more specifically, over one third of dementia caregivers are daughters. And um, nearly 19% of women Alzheimer's caregivers had to quit work, either to become a caregiver or because their caregiving duties had become too burdensome. So Alzheimer's is a very tough condition. More research in these areas will extend our understanding of how biological, societal, and cultural factors affect brain health and Alzheimer's risk, which will turn and lead to improved diagnosis, management, and individualized treatment options for both men and women. So please call the clinic, participate in what you can do. And thank you so much for to the Cleveland Clinic, the Rubo um, Center for Brain Health for all that they do in these research and clinical studies as well. For now, this is Doris Bauer, your Philippine Nurse host, signing off. The Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada has just brought you Philippine Nars, news and features about the Philippine American nursing community and beyond. Fridays, 7 p.m. on PHLV Radio.